Welcome to another presentation of Capital Economics. We are continuing our discussion on some recessionary indicators and our analysis on the overall business cycle. The most recent presentation that we just posted to our website, thecapitalnews.com, and our YouTube channel at The Capital News was in regards to average hourly earnings, the average work week, and real income. Today, we are going to continue this with recession, the economic puzzle pieces, U.S. GDP, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Now, to be consistent with what we have been discussing here at the Capital News in regards to the business cycle, we want to make sure that this audience is on the same page. And so I state this at the outset of every presentation. You are likely going to hear on the mainstream media, on financial uh, news broadcast that a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. This is what may be deemed the technical definition of a recession. However, it is the National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER, and a committee within this organization that makes the official determination as to when a recession occurs and its duration. So a recession is a period of falling economic activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, normally visible in real GDP, real income, employment, industrial production, and wholesale retail sales. Now, previous presentations have covered real income, employment. This one is going to focus on GDP. Subsequent presentations will also cover industrial production and wholesale retail sales. Previous presentations have also covered recessionary indicators such as the yield curve. We've done in-depth analysis on central bank balance sheet expansion and quantitative easing and quantitative tightening and its effects thereof, and also on central bank policy as to whether or not they are pricking bubbles, the very bubbles that they likely cause. So with that said, let's get started with GDP. So gross domestic product, GDP, you hear it all the time in the news, but what is it how is it calculated? Well, it's it's virtually a, a simple arithmetic calculation where GDP equals C for consumption, I for domestic investment spending, G for government spending, and net exports, where net exports consists or is calculated as exports minus imports and since and since, and since we purchase more imports. We do more importing than exporting here in the United States. This tends to be a negative number in this calculation and therefore is a net drag on GDP. However, there is some caveats to that, but we're not going to discuss that here in today's presentation. So here we have U.S. real gross domestic product. And just for the sake of argument and for the sake of informing you and giving you a broad picture of U.S. growth, this data goes back all the way to 1947 up to today in 2019. So this is just to show you that I believe there's about 11 recessions and the, the recessions are indicated by these uh, vertical purple bars here. And the thickness of them uh, is representative of the duration or the severity of said recession. And as you can see, I mean, the U.S. economy continues to hum along. We got about seven, I'm sorry, about 11 recessions during this time frame, 1947 to 2019. So roughly every seven years, we run into a recession. Now, it's interesting to note, and we have stated this multiple times in various presentations and on our podcast at the Capitol News, that the United States is currently experiencing its longest expansion in the business cycle in recorded U.S. history. So we are getting long in the tooth, but the question remains, are we about to peak? Are we about to hit the peak of this expansion and turn over and enter into a recession? That is what these presentations and the podcast is all about. So that's just to give you a fuller picture of 1947, but we're not going to go that far back in our analysis. We're going to stick with about 1970 to 2019, and we cover about a period of seven recessions, not 11, but seven, going back to 1970 to the current time. And again, like I like to tell the audience during these presentations, keep it simple, don't overlook anything, take a deep breath, and identify and observe everything and don't take it for granted because every detail is important. The duration of this data, the trend of this data, 
everything. Just pay attention to everything. And as you can see, and this is this is this makes intuitive sense. If you're going to be entering a recession, it makes sense that you're probably going to hit peak GDP. And then when you enter the recession, you're going to either plateau or you're going to start to decline. And that's exactly what we see. And you, you witness this pretty much through the entirety of these several recessions here in the uh, dot-com bust, the 2001 recession. You see a peak in GDP, a relatively uh, flat plateauing effect. And then you continue onward as you make your way through. Same thing happened during the great financial crisis. You hit, you hit peak GDP, you start to come down, you plateau, and, and due to the severity of the Great Recession, you really took a hit and continued falling throughout the recession, bottoming out towards the end of the recession. Again, it makes intuitive sense because those metrics that we highlighted at the beginning of this presentation as to what the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at to make its determination as to when a recession begins and when a recession ends, it makes sense that GDP bottoms out at the end or near the end of said recession. Now, we've been continuing on relatively strongly, sort of a continuation of trend over the past uh, few decades. Again, the question is, we're long in the tooth. Are we starting to peak out here in 2019, or do we still have room to go? And a deeper look into consumption and investment and government spending and net exports is going to paint a vivid picture as to where we are likely headed. So now we're going to look at the same graph with the same data, but year over year percentage changes. So it gets a little noisier, obviously, with the volatility on a quarter over quarter change on a yearly basis. But nevertheless, what do we notice? We have our zero line. Anywhere south of zero is obviously negative territory and is indicative of contraction. So we see that in the 1970 recession. We see that in the, further in the 1970s, the 1980s, early 1990s. However, we did not go negative in the 2001 recession. Interesting, isn't it? And that's why I stress at the beginning of these presentations, not just to take the technical definition, but to understand how and why the National Bureau of Economic Research makes the determination. Because it's not just GDP, it's a handful of macroeconomic indicators. Now, clearly, there was a, a steep, a steep decline during the Great Recession, and one that we haven't seen virtually in generations. Now, will we see that again? It's possible, likely. That's another question that's up for debate, but that's something we discuss all the time on our podcast at the Capitol News. But what we can see here clearly is that we are starting to roll over. Now the question is, will this downward trend continue? Because, you know, we're told on a political stand, from a political standpoint that this is the greatest economy in U.S. history. Clearly, if you were to say, well, GDP, well, that's simply not the case because we're just, just north of 2% currently, uh, but we've been well above 2% in the past and not the, you know, too distant past either. So why are we continuing downward? We have forecasts from the Federal Reserve itself that are now projecting fourth quarter GDP to be just north of 1%. If you follow us on the Capital News Podcast, we talk about the cash freight index, and given their data that they look at, and they're primarily concerned with the transportation sector, which is a leading indicator, they are predicting that the U.S. is going to enter into negative GDP territory in either the third quarter, which that data is going to be coming out soon, or the fourth quarter of this year. So we'll keep you posted as to what happens there. But clearly they are seeing a further deterioration in U.S. GDP. We're only a couple percentage points away from entering that zero and entering into negative territory. So if things continue, will we get there? Time will tell. So one of the uh, functions, one of the, one of the uh, parts of the calculation for GDP is obviously personal consumption expenditures, and that's what we're uh, looking at here. This is the bulk, by far the bulk, over 60%, almost 70% of the GDP calculation takes place in personal consumption expenditures. This is the quote-unquote resilient and very strong U.S. consumer. Of course, they're maxed out on their credit card debt, but we do love to spend money here in the United States, and that is indicative here of this graph. I mean, even in recession, you might see a plateauing effect and obviously a somewhat of a bottoming out depending on the severity 
of the recession. Again, we had a big doozy in the Great Recession back in 08 through 09 here, uh, where you had a big drop off. And again, that bottoming out comes at the end of the recession. But there were previous recessions where the consumer is relatively unfazed. Again, that 2001 recession, yeah, there's a little bit of a plateauing effect you can see here, but relatively we continued on the uptrend. So there is some truth in that, that the U.S. consumer is resilient, albeit whether or not they are making prudent uh, investment choices and financial choices is another question. Uh, but nevertheless, they do like to spend money. And as we can currently see here, we are continuing to drift higher as we make our way towards the end of 2019. Now, it's also important to note that the consumer is typically the last shoe to fall, that last pillar that gives way and really indicates that you are in recession. Now, let's look at the year-over-year -year change here. Again, a little bit noisier. And typically, again, if we find ourselves in negative territory, it tends to imply that we are in recession, as we can see through the past several recessions. Again, it is important to note that even though we were in a recession in 1970 and even in the 1982 to 1984 recession and again the 2001 recession, we were not in negative year-over-year -year territory. There was not a real contraction, meaning negative territory, when it comes to personal consumption expenditures in the United States. Now, where do we currently find ourselves? Actually starting to drift upward once again. And this could be indicative of a business cycle that is nearing its peak because another thing that we looked at and we just described in a previous presentation when we, when we were dealing with average hourly earnings and the work week and real income, that we are seeing an increase in average hourly earnings, which is a good thing, but it's also indicative of a cycle that is nearing its end. It's nearing its peak. And the analogy I like to use here is if you climb Mount Everest and you're at the top, the only way you have to go now is down. Okay, so if you're at the peak of the expansion in the business cycle, the only way to go now is down and enter recession. The question becomes the severity of that recession. Okay, it's a good thing to get rid of, you know, uh, malinvestment, liquidate debts, allow corporations to go through bankruptcy and restructure. If they come out alive and well, good for them. If they go bye bye, that's fine too. It allows for the next round of entrepreneurs to come into the market and attempt to do a better job. So we'll keep you posted on this. But the U.S. consumer, despite some poor choices maybe on a financial standpoint, they are resilient. We have private domestic investment. Now, just real briefly here, especially for those of you who follow the financial markets, just sort of take a look at the overall shape of this graph here, of this data. Does that remind you of anything? It should. It should remind you of what the S&P 500 looks like. It should remind you of what the Dow Jones Industrial Average looks like. It should remind you of what the Wilshire 5000 Stock Index looks like, because this is exactly what it looks like. And in subsequent presentations, we're not only going to talk about just economic variables, we're also going to incorporate those economic variables by overlaying financial data, such as stock market indexes. And if we were to graph the S&P 500 on this line as well, on this graph as well, or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the Wilshire 5000, you almost have a mirror image. It's quite phenomenal, which is why investment is such an important figure when it comes to the overall health of the economy. And that is why it is something that the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at. And again here, if we go back just here a few recessions, like everything else, there tends to be a peaking of this number of investment before the recession, and then it starts to plateau and head south. Same thing happens here in the 2001 recession. You peak a few quarters before the recession begins, and you continue your downtrend again, ending near or at the end of the recession, which again makes intuitive sense. Before the subprime crisis and the catalyst of the great financial crisis, you had peak investment a few quarters before the recession began. And then you really had a big sell-off due to the severity of the Great Recession. And now we've been continuing upwards relatively strongly. And over the past few years, pretty much since the beginning of the Trump administration, we have seen a steady and sharp increase in business investment. However, a lot of this was driven from the back, on the back of a massive tax cut. 
that tax cut was not free, ladies and gentlemen. There was not a lot of government uh, spending that was cut. And now we have trillion-dollar deficits once again. So this thing is being paid for by trillion-dollar deficits. And the positive, quote-unquote, stimulative effect of these tax cuts is starting to wane, especially as is evidenced on corporate balance sheets and in U.S. stock markets. And what we're seeing right now is a peak in this number, at least for now. There's no reason to say that this can't reverse trend and continue back going upward, but at least right now it appears that we have peaked and we are now starting to come down. That does not bode well for the, recent, for the economy. It tends to portend that we will be finding ourselves in a recession in the not too distant future. What does this look like on a year-over-year -year basis? I'm glad you asked. On a year-over-year -year basis, this, this chart looks very similar to everything else that we have looked at. And any time that we enter negative territory, we typically find ourselves in recession. There was a couple head fakes in the past. During the mid-1980s, we did enter negative territory a couple times, and we were not faced with an imminent recession. Now, of course, there were two back-to-back -back recessions in the early 80s, so perhaps this was just a head fake in the mid-80s, but we did enter negative territory in the late 80s and once again in the early 90s, which portended the recession that took place in 1990-1991. We also have another head fake recently, back in 2015 and 2016, which took place in this current expansion of the business cycle. And if you recall, 2015, 2016 was mired in a mild mini recession that pertained to pretty much global manufacturing. So it's not a surprise to see that business investment actually contracted, but it was contained primarily to the manufacturing sector. And so it didn't sort of seep out and affect the broader economy at large. And that is why we're not seeing any type of purple vertical bar indicate, indicating a recession. However, as was evidenced on the previous chart, we are starting to see a downtrend. Will this downtrend continue is anybody's guess, but what we're seeing with leading, indica leading economic indicators, such as the cash freight index, such as the Dow theory of the Dow Jones transports, such as small cap index, such as PMIs and ISM numbers, these things are continuing to deteriorate globally and being the leading indi economic indicators that they are, one can rationally conclude that this downtrend is likely to continue. Next up, we have U.S. real net exports of goods and services. Now, the reason why this data doesn't go back to 1970 is because I use a, a, a data add-in uh, and I was just going straight across the board with what was already uh, made available. I wasn't going in and doing any type of deep search. I was just pulling up what was readily available. There's no question that I will be doing subsequent podcasts on each of these individually. So look for, uh, look for it in the future. There will be a lot more data when it comes to uh, real net exports. And again, net exports are exports minus imports. We import more than we export. So that's why these figures are negative, negative the whole way through. That's what we do here in the United States. Now, it's interesting to note that politically speaking, we're told how damaging and how bad it is to have large trade deficits. Well, lo and behold, look at this trend line. Look at this trend line. We are now near $1 trillion because this is in, in billions and this is a thousand. So a thousand billions would be a trillion. We're right now at about $980 billion in trade deficits right now. Okay, this is not good. This is not the trajectory that I think the White House wants you to believe currently. And I don't want to get off on a political tangent. I do enough of that on the Capital News podcast. But just for the sake of argument, this is not the direction one would think we would be headed if we were quote unquote winning. So this is just something to be mindful of. Now, clearly you can see during the recession, the Great Recession, the only one we have here on this chart, we saw a strong uptick throughout the recession. And this is simply because the consumer was weak and we were not importing as much as we typically do. And so it allowed for the trade gap to narrow to, you know, about 400 and some odd billion dollars. And then we've sort of plateaued and started coming down ever since. Now, will this reverse course? It very well may. It very well may. But that is not what we are currently witnessing. Okay, just to be mindful of that. Then year over year, uh, again, 
despite that fact that we are in a downward trend, which is, is obviously continuing since when we peaked in, in 2015, it is still downward. But nevertheless, on a quarter over quarter basis, on a year over year basis, uh, it is trending upward ever so slightly. Again, will that continue? Time will tell. And lastly, we have Uncle Sam and how much of our taxpayer dollars he spends. Now, this is kind of a little different, okay? And you're going to see what I mean on the year-over-year -year graph. Because now, when you have U.S. government spending increasing, this is typically on the back of the economy being in some sort of financial or economic stress, okay? And that's why you have government spending that continues to increase, during periods of recessions or economic and financial stress because we operate here in the United States as do several countries around the world operate off of the Keynesian theory, the Keynesian belief that it is incumbent in a proper rule in duty of government to intervene in the marketplace to increase GDP because GDP after all is a simple arithmetic calculation, which we went over at the beginning of this presentation. If you can increase GDP, all else being equal, you will increase GDP. Now, if those other figures, consumption, investment, net exports, if those numbers continue to deteriorate, but you have an uptick in government spending, then the deterioration is not as bad as it otherwise would be. You follow? So it makes intuitive sense from an arithmetic standpoint. However, is that the proper role of government to intervene and sort of pick winners and losers? I say it isn't. I think it's healthier if the markets were allowed to do what they do best and serve as the best regulator because failure is the best regulator. And again, like I said on previous slides, if entrepreneurs and businesses, if they've over leveraged, if they've made too many malinvestments, they now either have to file for bankruptcy, they have to go through restructuring, they have to sell off their assets. And if they can come out better, fantastic, good for them. If they go out of business, that's too bad. It's now time for the next entrepreneur who thinks he can do it better to step up and attempt to do it better. That's how the market is supposed to work. So you can see here during these past several uh, recessions, you have an increase in government spending throughout these recessions and most clearly through the great financial crisis. And if you recall that, it was only a decade ago, we were in trillion, trillions of dollars in a yearly deficit. And now we currently stand, again, at a trillion dollar deficit, and we are inching ever closer to $23 trillion in a national debt. So we've come down since the Great Recession, and we've bottomed out in about 2014, only to say, yeah, yeah, let's get back to where we are. So what is this indicating? Is this starting to indicate that there are financial and economic stresses lurking beneath the surface? Because this is a rather sharp increase, as you can see by the slope of this line. So is this going to increase? And the shocking thing is, or not so shocking if you follow me on the Capital News Podcast, how can you have an increase in government spending to this degree? How can you have trillion-dollar deficits if we are told on a near daily basis that this is the greatest economy ever in the history of the United States? So that's something to think about. So here on a year-over-year -year basis, what I thought was interesting to note, and as you can see, this is an inverse of what we've been witnessing when it came to consumption, investment, and net exports. You have an increase during the recession. Not a decrease, not a contraction, if you will, in government spending, but an increase. So if we go all the way back to the mid-80s and we see these peaks, this is following a rather strong downward trend line. And we're right on this trend line, ladies and gentlemen. Now, is that indicative that we are in recession? Or are we simply waiting for further revisions to come out so the National Bureau of Economic Research can make the determination that the U.S. economy has already been in recession? Or is this just simply indicative that we are ever so closer, getting closer and closer to hitting the peak of this expansion and will soon be in recession? Or is it possible that this trend line means absolutely nothing and we're just going to continue going on with trillion dollar deficits as if nothing's wrong? I'm more in the camp that this line is going to hold some value. We might breach above it a little bit. Nevertheless, I do think a recession is around the corner. So with all of that said, I'd like to thank you for your time in this presentation. Please like, share, subscribe, and get the word out. You can follow us on thecapitalnews.com. You can follow us on YouTube and at Apple Podcasts at The Capital News. And you can also follow us on 
Twitter as well, and we hope that you do. If you'd like to support the channel in further detail, you can do so by purchasing our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing in the Era of Too Big to Fail, It Pays to Be a Cynic, and I thank those who have taken the time to purchase this book. You can find it on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and a Kindle electronic version is available as well. This is something that you want to have in your library. Believe me when I tell you this book was published in 2015. Everything that we stated in that book has come true or is about to come true. You want to know what's going on? Purchase our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. Thank you so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. Until next time, I am Alex Kreitas.